These glorious waters off the coast of Bermuda are home to one of the most coveted game fish species in the world, the giant blue marlin. The blue marlin is the largest of the Atlantic marlins and one of the biggest fish in the world. Native to tropical and temperate waters, the blue marlin is among some of the most recognizable of all fish. Joe's gonna hold him up, I'm gonna plop the tag. In this incredible episode, Neil and the Ocean Vet team are on a scientific mission to satellite tag one of these powerful animals. Their aim is to collect marlin movement data and provide the information to an international billfish conservation project. We've decided that although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. After several grueling hours at sea, the team's luck changes when a sports fishing boat decides to hand over a huge blue marlin for the tagging procedure. This fish is gonna swim, man. He's the dorsal's up, he's gonna swim, I tell you. On occasions, these monster fish are caught and killed in fishing competitions. Utilizing the body of one such fish and Neil's unique veterinary skills, the team will also be dissecting and studying the anatomy of these incredible animals. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. Together with unique tracking data to support this animal's conservation and the body of a marlin donated to the Ocean Vet team for research, this episode reveals the very makeup of Bermuda's famous blue marlin. So the blue marlin is considered by many to be the ultimate sport fish. Requires serious gear because its powerful runs can strip a reel of line in no time. This is a large bait that we use. We troll this behind the boat. And the reel here is capable of exerting massive amounts of drag uh, so that we can tire the fish out. Hopefully, we tire the fish out before we tire me out. Catching one of these huge fish for tagging will not be easy. Choi Ming, the series marine biologist, Andrew Kirkpatrick, the team's underwater videographer, Dylan Ward, the team's fisherman, and Oscar Doyce, the second boat captain, will all be working together to bring a blue marlin to the side of the boat. So at first glance, you may think that this is a fairly large lure, but you have to consider that a 1,000-pound blue marlin is entirely capable of eating a 200-pound yellowfin tuna in one bite. The Atlantic blue marlin are under intense fishing pressure. In the Caribbean alone, Japanese and Cuban fishermen annually take over a thousand tons of this fish. All right, we're on it. Just watch the tag on the floor. Yeah, on this side. Neil and his team's goal is to satellite tag a Bermuda blue marlin. The tag data will be sent to the Billfish Research Project and shared with fishery policymakers to help protect billfish species like the blue marlin from overfishing. There's one thing about marlin fishing, we've always got to look at how these lures are working. Captains and mates will obsess about the action of these different lures, saying this lure works better in this condition, this lure works better in another sea state. Personally, I think as long as it throws bubbles and a marlin's hungry, he's going to eat it. The team have been fishing the deep sides of Challenger Bank for several hours. Several other large sports fishing boats are also fishing around Bermuda's banks. In an attempt to increase the team's chances of tagging a blue marlin, Dylan puts out a radio message offering a thousand dollars to any boat that transfers a large blue to the team. It looks like their plan may have worked. Although blue marlin fishing requires a great deal of patience, we haven't got quite enough. Another boat has hooked up a blue, and we are going to go and take that blue, transfer it to this boat, and put a piece of tag in it. So we're pulling all our lines in, and we're heading over to the other boat right now. Neil opens the throttles on each of the 250 horsepower engines, hurtling the ocean vet boat over the ocean at 50 miles an hour straight towards the sports fishing boat Marlin Fever. En route, more information comes over the radio. They might kill it. They've already got a boat side. They've already got a boat side. It sounds like the animal may be killed as a contender for the Bermuda Marlin World Cup. 
The Marlin World Cup is held in Bermuda each year and has a 98% release ratio. But if a marlin is large enough, it may be killed for a top prize. However, the World Cup donates hundreds of thousands of dollars to conservation projects established to ensure the number of these fish now and in the future. Yeah, look at his dorsal going up. All right. In total, sport represents only 1% of blue marlin mortality, and all fish killed are eaten or donated for scientific research. Snap swivel is coming. Gab a pentin bottle as a fat. Back in the action, Neil and the team have reached marlin fever, and the fish is still alive. All right, so uh, marlin fever is going to donate their blue to us. We're going to give them our snap swivel. We're going to take over the fish. We are going to land it on bones, and we're going to put a piece out archival tag in it. What would you like to call it? Well, well, we'll call you back on the dock. You can tell us what you want to call the fish, and we'll get your email so we can send you guys the track and everything. Yeah. Choi has now transferred Neil's fishing line to Marlin Fever, where their crew have attached it to the leader hook to the fish. Good, let him go. Neil now has control of this blue marlin. So we now have a blue marlin on the line. We're going to bring him over to our boat. We're going to leader him on our boat. And we're going to put a piece of archival tag in this fish. And we're going to track it around the ocean. And she's, he's swimming right now. I can feel him pulsing below me right here. In the background, the ocean vet team are scrambling to ready the boat and equipment needed to handle this fish. The blue marlin is under the boat, making slow circles, swimming strongly. We're just getting our team organized. OK, now I want you to idle forwards, keeping the fish on the port side of the boat. Once the animal is at the surface and within reach, Dylan quickly inserts the water hoses to pump oxygen over the animal's gills. I can see the color returning to this fish as we're pumping this oxygenated water over his gills. It really seems to be doing a great job of reviving him. I'm going to jump in the rib. We're going to put the tag in this fish and let him go. Just watch the tag on the floor. Time is now of the essence. The welfare of this animal is Neil and the team's top priority. Stress can easily kill these gigantic fish. I've got the tail. Come on. All right. I'm ready to place the tag. I've pre-made the hole. You ready? Bring him in a little closer. Tag is placed. Check it. Tag is placed. And firmly check. That's it. The tag is in. Peace out tag is deployed in this fish. Good luck, buddy. I'm going to jump overboard. Next, Neil jumps in to prepare for the release. Neil, what's happening? This fish is going to swim, man. His dorsal's up. He's going to swim, I tell you. OK, let it go. I think you can release him. In six months, the tag will drop off this fish and transmit its data to satellites hundreds of miles above. The tag on this fish, among others, is providing the data needed to legislate protection and enhance conservation for this economically and ecologically important species. So, so that was it. Yeah, the Ocean yeah. Bed team has tagged and released the blue marlin out here on Bermuda's Challenger Bank exactly as we'd hoped to do so. And the good news is we didn't have to spend six days ourselves fishing for it. Woo! Patience is a virtue, but sometimes the impatience actually can be better. Right? Yeah. Next, the Ocean Vet team are preparing to dissect a 573-pound blue marlin. So it's the morning of our dissection. We're here at the Spanish Point Boat Club, and we have a large blue marlin. We're going to open this fish up and see exactly the internal anatomy of this amazing marine giant. Choi and Ming, hey. Oscar Doyce, and Dylan Ward are our team. It's going to take all of us to cut this fish apart. This marlin has been killed for sport in the Bermuda Marlin World Cup, an international sports fishing competition. Although initially concerning, it's important to understand that sports fishermen donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to major conservation and research projects. Fortunately, my wife is off island at present and does not realize that her favorite kitchen knives are going to be used for cutting up this rather large fish. Neil and the team will be dissecting this fish in an attempt to show how much of an evolutionary miracle this species really is. 
Rather than it being served up, the team are seizing an opportunity to educate and share its impressive secrets. Neil believes that by increasing the public's understanding of this species, it's possible to inspire greater conservation. Wow, check the size of this fish. She is incredible. Over 500, so yeah, you're right. It's definitely a she. Definitely a female. 573 pounds of blue marlin. What a magnificent fish this is. So, Choi, what, what do we think the function is of this massive bill on this fish? Well, these guys love to um, they go in as schools of uh, prey fish. And what they do is they'll charge right in, and they'll actually slash back and forth, almost like a sword fighter with a sword. And they're hoping to uh, injure, damage, you know, even kill the fish right there. And then they go ahead and eat it. And not only that, they've, uh, they've actually skewered fish in the past. And in fact, there's one local fisherman, Ian Card, was transfixed by one, a bill on a fish bigger than this, apparently, which took him right through under the collarbone. And the fish took him out of the boat, 30 feet down under the water, he was lucky to survive. The fish never touched the boat. 30 feet through the air, six feet above water, took a 180 pound guy out of the boat. Yeah, I've heard that story and it's, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. The marlin's agility and extraordinary power has evolved over thousands of years to ensure that the animal can successfully hunt. This agility and power is provided by massive muscle groups that run down each side of the animal's body. These muscles are on the front line of ensuring the animal's survival. Removing and revealing these muscle groups is the team's first step to understanding how this animal's body functions. So Choi's making his first cut along the lateral line of this fish. We're gonna to try to remove the dorsal fillet, the main muscle group running down the back of this fish in one or two pieces. I'm gonna join him, I'm gonna cut from here, and my cut's gonna join his, I'm gonna remove this muscle. The animal has two types of muscle that have evolved to support different swimming behavior. Neil has taken a sample of the combined muscle to the inspection mat for a closer look. So here we have the loin of our marlin. I'm gonna cut right through it here and show you the two different muscle masses. This is his anaerobic, his fast twitch muscle. This is what gives him his huge amount of power. As this contracts either side of his spine and flexes him, it generates a rear-facing wave of motion which powers him out of the water. Tail walks, spectacular. He can pull a 12-ton fishing boat backwards through the water. This, on the other hand, is his red muscle, which allows this fish to travel thousands of kilometers looking for food without burning any energy. As we released our fish, he swam away on this muscle. This was not tired. This muscle was shattered. Blue marlin are able to recover from extreme spells of exhaustion and travel thousands of miles by switching between their different muscle types. Feeding both these muscle groups with vital oxygen is the job of the animal's huge gills. Choi and Neil have removed the protective gill plate to take a closer look. So yesterday we had a fish alongside the boat and we put a tag in it. What we were very careful to do was when we slowed the boat down, we put two hoses into the mouth of this fish and we sent oxygenated water from our pumps straight over the gills of this fish. And that mimicked absolutely the movement of a fish at several miles an hour through the water. These fish can ventilate enough for their slow twitch muscles when they're moving at one or two miles an hour. But when they're moving fast, they generate way more oxygenation and that's what we mimicked with our hoses. Oxygen is actually pulled out of the water by the gills and it actually transfers through little filaments right into the bloodstream. And these are very, very fine structures. Blood passes against seawater within about a millionth of a meter, one micron. So it's a very, very tiny area. And there's actually about eight of them here times two sides. That's a huge amount of surface area that it actually has in a compact space to pick up oxygen out of the water. So you can see, even though this is a small structure, it is enough surface area to grab oxygen for a fish this size. Oxygen is the key to the animal's overall function, but so is the energy created from its food. The marlin's eyes are its secret weapon when it comes to finding this food. The function of the eyes have an incredible secret. 
Neil and Choi have removed the armor plating around the organ to find out more. So now that we've cut away the bony portion at the back of the orbit here, we can reveal the muscles that attach to this tough eyeball. Yeah, and right here, yeah, right where your finger is, I can see perfectly what's referred to as the thermogenic organ. And the thermogenic organ is effectively um, some extraocular eye muscles that sit in the back. And over time, what has happened is they have uh, evolved less in terms of the uh, contractile myofilaments, mm -hmm. and they've increased in the number of uh, mitochondria, producing more ATP. So that generates a whole lot of heat. So basically, not very much elasticity or strength, but a whole lot of heat generating behind this eyeball. So we have central heating for this fish's eyeball. Exactly. And not only that, but the blood also runs into the retina. It's warm. The eye works way better when the fish is down a mile deep in the cold, cold water of the deep abyss. He can still see. The other fish can't, so he's got the upper hand. Also, his brain is receiving a blood vessel from this same heater organ. So he's got a warm brain. He doesn't get cold, he doesn't get hyperthermia, he's cooking. The internal heating system in this otherwise cold-blooded animal allows the fish to spot prey effectively in cold, deep water. In order to reach this deep, cold water, the marlin uses its swim bladder, a special organ that allows the animal to quickly move up and down through the vast water column. This is fascinating, man, look at this. We've got the swim bladder sitting here, and I believe we've got the rest of the organs located right down beneath it, right here. So here's the swim bladder. We can actually remove it from the fish. This is filled in a remarkable way. Oxygen is drawn from the bloodstream into the bladder to increase the buoyancy and bring the marlin up in the water column. In fact, anglers have seen marlin with their dorsal and tail out of the water, floating right at the surface. Then, when he needs to, oxygen can be returned to the depleted blood here at the rear of the swim bladder, reducing its buoyancy and allowing the fish to sink down, much in the same way that a diver would use a BCD, a buoyancy control device, to move up and down in the water column. The main skeletal element inside the marlin is the vertebral column. Similar to a human spine, it's composed of multiple vertebrae, in the case of the marlin, the vertebrae are considerably different. I'm good on this end. It's just that side that needs a little. little and bit here off. we have it. And what you may be able to see here, it's difficult to see, but the actual vertebral body is here, and here, and here. And yet the spinous processes are separated by some two inches on either side. So basically, we've got an interlocking vertebral body system which gives this fish this flexibility and yet this rigidity. So when those big powerful muscles pull this fish from side to side, it's like a spring driving him through the water and powering him into the air. Neil and Choi have revealed some of the blue marlin's impressive anatomy and shared a few of its truly remarkable features. Features that have enabled this fish to thrive throughout our planet's oceans. But one part of the marlin's anatomy has evolved above all others, the blue marlin's tail. So we've seen how the muscle and the vertebral column generate the power that goes to the tail. Here it is, the most efficient oscillating propeller that we know. This, when driven through the water, can produce speeds of over 40 miles an hour for this fish and throw it 30 feet through the air. Guess what? I have almost an exact replica, and this is the latest modern computer-designed foil for my windsurfer. Look how remarkably similar it is to what nature has achieved after natural evolution has occurred over millions of years. The marlin had it right all along. A variable aspect foil, brilliant in design. Dissecting an animal like this has provided me with a unique opportunity to learn more about this creature. Like so many marine species, they are often out of sight, out of mind. This has reaffirmed to me why we work so hard to protect all marine species. They deserve our attention. They have developed into such remarkable creatures. Neil and the team continue to work with the sports fishing community 
and plan to tag more blue marlin in the coming years. I'm ready to place the tag. Okay. The tag on this fish revealed the marlin traveled 300 miles north of Bermuda. It was likely following the Gulf Stream's temperature gradient. This cold and warm water meeting point tends to accumulate marine life. It's highly likely this blue marlin was in pursuit of food. I think you can release it. Sadly, the tag malfunctioned and popped off just after this journey. Consequently, no long-range migration was recorded. Neil and the team will be continuing their work to gather more data, data that will ultimately help protect this species long into the future. Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team join the Bermuda Turtle Project, helping to collect vital data in a bid to improve the numbers of green sea turtles around the world. He actually looks in pretty good shape. Neil will also be rescuing sick green sea turtles from Bermuda's beaches to rehabilitate and release them back into the wild. We wish this guy all the best. He has a tough road ahead as he continues on his epic journey. Good luck, little one.